Good day, fellow investors. I'm here with head investment manager of Niche Master Funds, Peter Barklin. And as would Warren Buffett say, don't worry about the stock market crashing, just buy great businesses. As a former consultant for more than 30 years, advising the biggest businesses in the world, Peter Barkling and his partner Perry Enster have their money in their own fund where they focus on buying great, amazing businesses. However, we hear that word, buy great businesses and then you don't care about what happens in the market, uh, then your focus lies on that and you ha don't have to worry about anything. But the question is, of course, what the hell are great businesses? How do we find them? How we, do we select them? And how do we buy them and then have sleep well at night, let's say, with our investments? And I'm so happy today that Peter has agreed to explain how he does it, how he finds great businesses, and how he uses his 30 years of consulting background to find those great businesses. And I have seen stocks in his uh, portfolio that went up five times over the last few years because those are great businesses and they just keep doing what they're doing no matter what happens uh, in the market, in the economy, and no matter what happened in the last 10 years, which is actually a great business. So please tell us about how the hell did you find those stocks that went up five times because they are great businesses? Uh, <laughs> well, well, so Sven, you start by saying uh, we are value investors. We consider ourselves to be value investors, but people define that differently. And some would define that as simply buying the cheapest companies you can find. And there's a statistical case for that. Uh, it's not our, uh, st our style, though, because, you know, when you get burned from... Uh, the problem with very cheap companies is that a lot of them don't deserve to be any more expensive. As somebody once said, a bargain that remains a bargain is not a bargain. Uh, so so what, what our style has become, uh, I think I can say, is we like to buy companies of very high quality. And they are more expensive than you know, just the cheap companies. But we distinguish very clearly between price and value. And so if we can buy a really valuable company uh, periodically when opportunities occur, for a price that is lower than that value, then we tend to pile into those companies. And that allows us to not only make the profit from the investing, but also to sleep at night, because we know that these companies are very, very sure that these companies will sustain anything the markets throw at them. How do you know so what is the value and when the price is below that yes. value? So, so first, I mean, first, uh, I think maybe I should just first say, so what is, how do you find these great companies? And m most of them are easy. If you want to have, it's very, very easy. They're very famous. Coca-Cola is a great company. Uh, Procter & Gamble is a great company. Uh, Unilever is a great company. But here's the problem. They are all well-known and very large companies. So those companies are likely to be called what we, uh, to be what we call fully priced. So the price already is at the level of the value. So what we try to do is to look for companies that are not, no, not famous yet, but are already uh, great companies, but are much, much smaller. And uh, the way we find them is little by little, we, we trawl to information, we read the press, we search databases and so on. Uh, and we have a list of criteria for what we define a great company to be. Uh, the first thing, which it may be obvious, but, but people tend to overlook it, in my opinion, is there has to be a long track record. You know, we don't buy anything on, on hopes and dreams. We, we, we buy things, to, uh, for example, uh, management can show that they have increased dividends every year for 15 years in a row. So, so we look for that long track record, solidity of management, uh, a company where management has been there for a long time and is likely to stay for a long time and are not of, you know, some managers will make some crazy decisions and you know, diversify or start some business that, that they have no business starting, in our opinion. Great management won't do that because they, they understand where the value of the company comes from. Uh, and we will look at a number of financial uh, things. We, we would, for example, uh, in another video we did, uh, we, we mentioned the concept of competitive advantage. So it follows that if a company really has a competitive advantage, then it must make a high level of return on capital, 
otherwise it's just talk. But then the logic also reverses. So when you find a company that consistently, not for one or two years, but consistently makes a high return on profit uh, on, uh, on capital, <coughs> then that company must have a strong competitive advantage. Now we just have to go and look for it and find what it is. So we simply start by looking for companies that are very profitable in terms of return on capital, return on equity, and so on and so forth. And then we use that to troll back to see where does that profit come from. Uh, so a high return on capital, uh, a huge effect and advantage of high returns on capital is that companies that have these high returns can grow and, fi and, and finance their own growth um, without having to invest too much money, by definition, because they use less capital. So that means they can grow and still pay dividends to us while they become bigger and more valuable. An example of such a company? Uh, we were talking about one yesterday. Decra Pharmaceuticals have increased their dividends every six months for the last 15 years at least, maybe even longer. Um, and uh, they, they, they not not at the expense of their debt going up, but simply as a result of them creating, generating more cash flow every year, more and more cash flow. They spend some of that cash reinvesting into the business. And some of that uh, cash flow could be, in this, their case they haven't done it, but it could be used to buy back shares. It could, uh, and, and the rest is used to pay to investors as dividends. So this DECRA pharmaceuticals that you spoke yesterday on the conference. So you say this is the 15 year track record of improving dividends yes. and you have seen a chart. Maybe I can use yes. uh, you sh show that chart to investors. Then you say the management is focused on returning money, wealth to shareholders yes. with that dividend and the management is not doing stupid things. And if I remember now from the conference, you said that they did something in 2013 can you explain uh, that, well, how they focus on their business and what they are good in, which other managements wouldn't do? That was amazing. Uh, many other, uh, okay, so back in 2012, this company had two major business divisions. One were, were vet, veterinarian surgeries around the United Kingdom. Another one was patent protected medicines for uh, pets and, and other animals. And those two businesses were hugely different in terms of their profit profitability and cash flow profiles and so on. The patient protected part, which was half the business, was vastly more profitable than the surgery business. Then one day they got approached by somebody who wanted to buy the, sur the vet surgeries. And of course the negative effect of that, the positive effect is suddenly you have a lot of money in your pocket. But the negative effect for many managers is that who would sell half the business we run? Because it's like it's, it's almost like telling people that we have given up. So in uh, not according to me, but according to a lot of managers, they will say that. But a truly great manager, uh, uh, such as the people who run Dekra, said, "You know what? What we do is we take we sell half the business. We use the proceeds from that those sales, hundreds of millions of pounds, to buy companies and to invest in further research and development." to strengthen our patent protected part of the business. And then we see that growth come back and now this time in a much more profitable company. And that's what they have done. And they're now back, almost back to the level of sales in 2012, but with much higher returns. Profit is maybe uh, at least twice what it was in 2012. So that so would be an example of great management. That's what I call great management yeah. and any day, yes. You're still invested in that company? We're still invested. In fact, it's a company that uh, has already been affected by Brexit. Uh, not Brexit itself, fundamentally in the company, but the market dealers around it. So we have actually just a few weeks ago uh, increased our in investment in the company. How much did the company fall because of Brexit? Uh, or Brexit uh, Because of these dealers. Maybe about 30 percent. And that's the fascinating thing be, be, between uh, difference between bad companies and good companies, or high quality companies as I call the good ones, is that they also fluctuate on the market. Yeah. So, so the market seems to have, uh, and, and the fluctuations means that it provides opportunities for investors, of course, to get in when, when they're not expensive. So it's not only 
Uh, that's, that's the fascinating part. It's not only the, the low quality companies that see their prices fluctuate, it's also the high quality ones. Mm -hmm. the, pro the difference is the high quality ones always come back, the low quality ones sometimes go to zero. Right. And that's what we don't want because that's what would keep us up at night. That would be permanent capital loss and that's Exa something yes. that yeah. doesn't fit Buffett's rule, don't lose money and this is his second exactly. rule, don't lose money. And some, oh sorry. So how would you summarize now, okay, what would be the three or five points that we have to focus on when looking at, the, at great business and when <coughs> wanting to find great businesses to invest in? Okay, so starting with the financial measures, uh, return on capital. Uh, ability to generate cash flow, uh, ability to increase, cons consistently increase dividends are, are three key things um, that are very quantifiable so, so, and, and easy to scan. You go into any uh, stock screener and, and they can find stocks that have those characteristics. But then we dig deeper. Uh, we look at um, uh, th th as, as you spoke about the quality of management, you have to find out, you know, what are their track record? Are they brand new in this business or have they, I mean, is, is this really what they stand for? Uh, and the consistency of having done this over a very long time and that is so important. And that, I mean, you don't see in any, even if you go to Bloomberg, uh, you know, you see maybe three or maybe five years of financial numbers. I want to see a lot longer and very consistent. Uh, so you have to do some footwork, you have to read some <laughs> annual reports. Um, and what else? Um, uh, th then this understanding about where the competitive advantage comes from that we have talked about before. Because without that we don't really know what the threats to the companies are. Because all companies, I mean all high quality companies are envied by competitors or potential competitors. So there's always some, as Steve Jobs used to say, his nightmare was that every morning thousands of engineers go to work around the world wondering how to outdo him. <laughs> and so that was, imagine that must have created some nightmares. So I want to know also what is it that our companies need to be able to protect so then I can look and scan the horizon for threats yeah. to those. So we try to understand that as well as possible. Is it patent protection? Because patents have only a short, relatively short lifespan. Or is it something else? Is it the scale of the business? Or is it the quality of the branding? Or, yeah, so, so there's at least uh, five, six things uh, uh, before you can truly use the term uh, high quality company. But, but just b b b start by, uh, I would advise you, start by looking at some that are famously high quality but are already too expensive, Coca-Cola for example. Just ask yourself, what are the qualities of Coca-Cola? Asking about Coca-Cola, what, what do you mean when you say that it's too expensive? What, what are you looking, what parameters are you looking there? So, so uh, I mean, the, the, we always do the easy uh, price earnings, price book and, and so on and so forth and see how much the inverse of the price earning is the earnings yield. So if you have a price earning of um, 25, as you probably do in Coca-Cola's case, that that's the inverse of that is 4% return to me. Uh, but then, of course, Coca-Cola's earnings grow. But 4%, mm, that 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 if I buy them at the current price, I only get 4% return, and then I wait for it to grow. And I think I think I can find some that are high quality, but where I can get 8%, or maybe even more than 10%. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one way of looking at it. Uh, w when we get to make a real investment, then we always do a cash flow, discounted cash flow uh, valuation, which is fraught with uh, problems, of course. Uh, as that other investor you mentioned before uh, used to say, this discounted cash flow value is a number that is uh, impossible to calculate but essential to estimate. And I think that makes a lot of sense because once you go through the calculation, uh, it's, it's not complicated to go through, but, but you realize that you change your assumptions just a little bit and the number becomes completely yeah. different. And so it really forces you to think about the assumptions and the assumptions are about the business. So that means you have to go back and say, what would 
a price drop of 5% mean or what would additional cost? And if we go back to the previous video we made, you can find those higher earnings yields within small companies because big, yes. big great businesses have already, uh, let's say, lower earnings year yield because everybody knows them and everybody wants them in their yes. portfolio. Yes, yes. Well, Typically. thank you. I think this was really amazing and it will really help uh, investors to focus on. And I think the hard part is, okay, you look at 100 businesses, but probably 99 you have to just, no, it's not, doesn't fit the criteria and you say next, which is, I think, the hard part when it comes to investing. Uh, yes. Um, but, but it's, it's actually, it makes life easier because I know, for example, uh, first of all, I don't have to troll to a lot of different companies and, and looking for bargains. Yeah, uh, uh. Um, because companies that are not highly profitable, I'm, I'm, I don't even need to look at them. Secondly, so, so, so what I do do is we have a list of, I don't even know how many companies are on it, of companies that fit the criteria based on the value they create. But don't fit it based on the price we pay. The price is too high. So I keep following those and I know I would love to own these if one day they come up for sale, which they sometimes do, and then we can add them to okay. the... So that makes life a little easier. The other thing about, um, about making life easier is that there are whole industries that don't create value. And the most famous one is airlines. Airlines just do not create shareholder value. They create lots of, lots of value for passengers, but not for shareholders. So that means I don't need to follow a single airline. So that already cuts out a lot. Not even the discount Ryanair? No, or no, because even, I mean, there's, there's a, last time I looked, because I do look, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were 730 airlines registered in the world, and uh, three of them had any real profitability. And if I need to look to 730 companies to find three nuggets, then I, I can, my time is better spent elsewhere, you know. Very interesting. Um, so, so Ryanair is a great company. Uh, Southwest Airlines in the U.S. is a great company. Uh, but I would not propose to have been able to identify those. I'll tell you what, one thing though, there's a company uh, in the indirect airline business uh, which is called uh, Amadeus, which uh, handles most ticketing systems around the world and they get all the value of the, I mean, this is a highly profitable company. It's a Spanish company quoted in Madrid, AMS Madrid, uh, which has been an excellent investment. It's too big, so it's not in our fund. But, uh, but, but that, so that's a way, a, a place to look. So that would fit the great business? That would fit the, that that's, is certainly a great business, uh, an excellent high quality business. So that one is on your list or not? Uh, or it's it's not big? on the list because it's too big. Oh, okay. So uh, it's it's, uh, and I I don't wish for it to get smaller. <laughs> so uh, so that's probably a ship that has sailed as far as we. But if I don't know, Spain goes bankrupt or Italy or if something, we might it, see the ETF sell yes. it and then buy a great business at a yes. lower price. Yes. But it's it's already. I mean, it's big. It's already well known. But oh, it, right. it's a it's just an example of of a company that is living on the fringes and then becomes interested. Well, thank you for discussing this. I think you mentioned some things that are very, very interesting, like return on invested capital or return on capital, return on equity, cash flows. So we can make a video on that, if you agree. Sure. Perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.